Hello, friends. Do you like the news? No? Me neither. Let's talk about something else! We're contractually obligated to talk about the news. Why would we sign anything like, all right, whatever. I don't want to fight. Okay, here's some news. Donald Rumsfeld just f***ing died, like right as we're filming this episode. And that's neat. Not just because it's like neat that he died, which it is, but also because Rumsfeld and Rumsfeld-like political figures are kind of sort of exactly what this video is about. Double neat. So I don't know if you know this, but Humans retain basically no information about their own history and make the exact same mistakes over and over again without ever learning a thing. Well, except for all those historically and culturally significant Confederate generals, I guess. You can't forget about them. Memorize the list, put their names on everything. But for the most part, it's always morning again in America, a new day where we're eager to set aside the past as quickly as possible and start fresh, even if the past is still happening and literally everything smells rotten, like a carcass slumped in the corner of the room that we choose to pretend simply isn't there, or rather, millions of carcasses resulting from an unnecessary and expensive war. Oh boy, we're not just going to talk about Rumsfeld, but also one of those Bush presidents, aren't we? And how we just love resurrecting and refurbishing the images of yesterday's failed leaders like their f***ing Zemo. Look at dancing Zemo. It's a little out of place. It's adorable. It's a Marvel movie reference. And speaking of sociopathic aristocrats doing a fancy little two-step to distract us from all the people they blew up just a few years ago, let's talk about former President George W. Bush. He's selling a new book of long cynical pause for emphasis, paintings of immigrants, and got invited to talk about them on both CBS Sunday Morning and the Today Show. Oh, did I mention the paintings are of immigrants? I feel like I just did, but honestly, all I can hear is the rushing sounds of hot Cody blood. Studio 43. That's it. <laughs> well, I can smell the paint, yeah. Oh, yeah. The occasion for our visit is the release of a new book of his oil paintings, Out of Many, One. Portraits of America's Immigrants. Now, myself and most of America only care about painting if it's being done to wainscoting in the context of an extreme home makeover or murder house flip. Available now on, oh, right. Anyway, so luckily the segment shifts very quickly from the art of brushstrokes to the art of post-mortem PR for an administration best known for torturing brown people. For example, take a look-see on how Bush and CBS explain the past 20 years of the immigration debate. Is it one of the biggest disappointments of your presidency? Not yes, me. it really is. I campaigned on immigration reform. I made it abundantly clear to the voters this is something I intended to do. Despite bipartisan backing, reform failed during Mr. Bush's tenure. Years later, Donald Trump made anti-immigrant rhetoric a centerpiece of his campaign. Once upon a time, President Bush tried to make some kind of change. What changed? Don't worry about that. Something any reasonable person would agree with, I'm sure. No need to Google the words Bush plus immigration, but despite bipartisan backing, Bush's effort for immigration reform failed. And then Donald Trump ruined everything with anti-immigrant rhetoric, which all good people on the right and left immediately rejected. And now a wistful George W. Bush is upset that people on both sides are using the immigration debate as some kind of fear -mongering tactic. Speaking of being wistful, remember when people had shame? Those were good times if they ever existed. Anyway, you may have noticed that some of the little details in that summary don't quite match up to anything that actually happened in the history of America ever. Let's even set aside how offensive it is, just in general, to take lessons in humanity and compassion from the guy who oversaw Abu Ghraib and started two absolutely devastating wars, costing more than half a million lives and pressing on for, what's that, what's that, hello? Decades. But all of that, um, war and torture aside, just on immigration policy alone, this framing doesn't really stack up. So let's do the thing. You know, the thing where we actually do Google President Bush plus immigration and see what comes up. A little trip to the early 2000s. Doesn't that sound fun? Maybe we'll Google Strong Bad or that Badger song next, but mostly it's 
It's going to be the atrocity stuff, I'm sorry. Anywho, upon arriving in office, Bush's first major legislative proposal was a guest worker program that temporarily allowed people with proof of employment to remain in the U.S., but didn't include a pathway to citizenship, and was roundly criticized as unsafe for immigrant workers, basically turning them into a permanent underclass. But, on the other hand, the portraits. No part of this worker program, of course, would do anything for the refugees currently arriving at our southern border. You know, the immigrants who were too busy escaping economic crises or devastating wars that were perhaps maybe kind of caused by the American government and darn it, just didn't have the time to phone ahead and hook up a part-time gig at the local Aaron Brothers. Or Michaels, depending on the region. There are art supply stores. Continuing on, and the Bush administration's big push for immigration reform culminated in the Secure Borders Economic Opportunity and Immigration Reform Act of 2007, which would have provided a path to citizenship for undocumented immigrants by creating a Z visa program that would give a probationary legal status. As a compromise, it significantly increased funding for security at the U.S.-Mexico border, including, you guessed it, 370 miles of additional fencing. The bill also would have introduced a so-called merit-based system for immigration moving forward. And yet, despite all this compromise with Republicans, the bill died in the Senate at 46 to 53 votes. And, oh, hey, it looks like 38 of the votes against were from Bush's own party. Then Bush, facing historically low poll numbers, gave up on immigration reform entirely. In his final 2008 State of the Union address, he took credit for building more fences at the border and ending the so-called catch and release program for migrants attempting to enter the US while, in fairness, reminding people that maybe we should make it easier for migrants to work in the US. We're increasing worksite enforcement, deploying fences and advanced technologies to stop illegal crossings. We've effectively ended the policy of catch and release at the border. And by the end of this year, we will have doubled the number of Border Patrol agents. Yet we also need to acknowledge that we will never fully secure our border until we create a lawful way for foreign workers to come here and support our economy. If that sounds familiar, I mean, minus the last part, it's because they are also the Trump administration's policies. Like, exactly. In fact, Trump was a huge fan of the Bush-era framing of merit-based immigration. Talked about it all the time, at least when he wasn't talking about, like, not being able to flush his toilet, how f***able his daughter is, defending birds from wind turbines, which he calls windmills, this. Rick Perry, watch him. He's a comer. This is the actual record. So it's kind of frustrating and awful and maddening and fourth thing that the guy behind that record is now going on TV pretending to be some visionary thinker or grounded voice of reason or even just a charmingly eccentric goofball who can laugh at himself. Now I have to say, I was very proud of you for dodging those shoes when it happened because it's like, I had uh, you were very, you have very good reflexes. Ha, I, my guess is that Laura had done that before. Yeah. Ha 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 you know how Bush had a shoe thrown at him because of all the war and death he caused? And then the journalist who threw the shoe was beaten, dragged out, and later tortured while in prison? Funny, funny stuff. How he dodged the shoe and it's like, his wife is mad at him. You get it? How when that man who was mad about all the war crimes threw a shoe at him, it was like his wife or something? Do you get it? Do you, you get it, right? The fact we're circling here is that on the major issues of the day, there is barely daylight between the Bush-Cheney years and the Trump-McConnell era. And what separation there is largely just comes down to tone. Oh, G to the WB didn't go on TV and directly say that all Mexicans are coming to America specifically and exclusively for the purposes of violent sexual assault. He left that part to the imagination. But couldn't we aim a little higher? Maybe aim for politicians who mix in policies and proposals with the possibility of actually doing some good for their constituents rather than just describing terrible policies with more upbeat and inclusive language? Oh, sorry, of course not. 
And it's not just GWB getting the Zemo treatment, or to our Fast and Furious fans, the Deckard Shaw treatment, hashtag justice for Han. The media can't wait to do this to every terrible person in our government, a process that begins essentially the moment they step away from the seat of power. Before it collapsed into a black hole of ego and fraud, the Lincoln Project lived and thrived in this safe zone between the fantasy of honorable conservatism and its ugly reality. And we're only a few short years out from the total rewrite of John McCain's legacy, from far-right hawk who occasionally crossed the aisle to vote with Dems on specific legislation, but mostly gave us Sarah Palin, and by extension this ghastly bullsh**, all the way to the patron saint of rational compromise, who can currently be seen fist-jabbing in heaven with civil rights leaders. Both NBC News and The Washington Post also trotted out former Speaker of the House John Boehner to diagnose where he thinks it all went wrong. Oh, let me guess. Was it decades of wasting everyone's time on a pointless culture war and stoking white supremacy while funneling cash exclusively to corporate donors and the uber rich? Well, Chuck, every day that uh, I saw this uh, beginning in 2011, uh, I pushed back on it. I did everything I could to uh, uh, bring all these members uh, into the Republican Party. Uh, into our team, uh, but some of them just didn't want to come. Uh, most of those so-called Tea Party types, uh, frankly, became very good Republicans. And on any given day, I had 210, 215 solid Republican votes. But on any given day, I had two or three dozen what I call knuckleheads uh, who wanted chaos, uh, who wanted it 100 percent their way or no way. Uh, but uh, every single day, the five years I was Speaker, uh, I tried to work to bring them into the party. Uh, some just wouldn't come. Ah! Of course, darn it! The answer was, uh... Knuckleheads. Those damn knuckleheads! Always knuckling heads and head-like things getting knuckled. Only, there's just a, a slight, small, teensy, dust-sized little problem with this version of events. The problem being that they're totally made up. Like a lie? These knucklehead conservatives who now control the Republican Party voted twice for Donald Trump and continue to deny the results of the 2020 election. They're not just a bunch of jokers running around trying to burn down Gotham. There's an obvious agenda, one with which John Boehner largely agrees and used his entire political career to push forward. If anything, he's just mad that the new generation is so bad and obvious about it. Like, the only difference between Donald Trump and someone like John McCain was that McCain got to solemnly shake his head when his own party got all racist against Obama. As if it wasn't, you know, his party doing that. And he simply had no control over it, you know? I mean, how could he be expected to represent the racist comments of his um, own vice presidential pick and clear prototype for what Trump would later become? Do you remember her? That lady who accused Obama of palling around with terrorists and whose base was so toxic and racist that it culminated with this moment. I gotta ask you a question. I do not uh, believe in, I can't trust Obama. I, I have read about him, and he's not, he's not, he's a, um, he's an Arab. He is not. No, no ma'am. No, no, ma no, ma no, ma he's a, he's a, he's a decent family man, citizen that I just happen to have disagreements with on, on fundamental issues. And that's what this campaign is all about. He's not. Thank you. Ah, yes. See, Obama isn't an Arab because he's a decent family man. Good recovery. So you can call them tea party types or proud boys or knuckleheads or whatever other charmingly folksy euphemism you please. But what you're describing are the white supremacists that make up a decent cross section of the Republican party's base. They're never actually going away and then coming back. Where would they even go? There's no rum springer for racists. Although I bet if you wrote a spec script about that, the Daily Wire might step in to produce. Hey Boehner, got any more stupid horse piss lies to piss out of your piss mouth? that leaks piss. Listen, America is a land of immigration. We've, uh, we've been the world's giant melting pot uh, for 250 years. Uh, and uh, we ought to celebrate the fact that we are this giant melting pot. Uh, and to see some members uh, of Congress go off and start uh, uh, this America First Caucus is I, it's the silliest thing I've ever, ever seen. And Republicans need to denounce it. You know, my second biggest regret uh, during my time as speaker 
is not being able to come to an agreement with President Obama mm -hmm. on an immigration reform bill. Biggest regret, you say? That's weird, because back in 2013, the Senate had actually passed immigration reform. Specifically, a bill that would have streamlined the legal immigration system and provided a path to citizenship for 11.5 million people already living in the U.S., including Dreamers. And again, this was back in 2013, when Trump was too busy with The Apprentice to even consider insulting Gold Star families instead of Meatloaf. But the Republican-controlled House killed these reforms in 2014, caving to the same hard-right knucklehead who totally don't represent what American Republicanism is really about. Boy, that must have really angered John Boehner at the time. I bet he really stuck it to the GOP House Speaker, John Boehner. That's, that's weird. These two people seem to have the exact same name. Perhaps Boehner 2.0 can explain. As much as I tried to work with President Obama to get immigration reform done, uh, every time I'd get ready to move, uh, the president... Uh, would set the, the field on fire. And uh, it, it, frankly, it made it almost impossible uh, to bring a bill uh, that hot, yeah. that controversial, uh, to the floor of the House. Of course, it was all Obama's fault and no one else's. Stupid Cody, how did I not realize that? And that's how these interviews go. The subject gets held up as the lone voice of reason in an increasingly unreasonable universe, rather than just another cog in the same broken system that got spit out a few years back and now wants to... I don't know. Whatever the cog version of writing a book would be. Writing a book? So Boehner blames an increasingly dysfunctional political system without actually talking about how it got that way. In fact, when pressed, he says, there's nothing I regret about my 25 years in Congress and I just tried to do the right thing every day and I didn't worry about it. So the guy calling for more collaboration and a more convivial attitude in Washington doesn't even regret, say, suing the president for trying to give more people health care. Probably because he knows he definitely won't be asked specifically about it ever. But this is the danger of our collective political amnesia combined with the media's love for refurbishing the images of old leaders now that the market is more favorable. You tell people a rosy, nostalgia-tinged story about the past and how things were just you know, better back then. And it both makes them feel comforted for their complicity and allows you to keep doing all the same awful stuff without fear of consequences or accountability. By the end of George W. Bush's presidency, it was obvious that compassionate conservatism was a myth, a hollow phrase that covered for mass murder and torture on an unthinkable scale, and somehow coexisted with an effort to brand the entire Islamic world as a terrorist axis of evil, a propaganda project with real, lasting repercussions haunting U.S. foreign policy and the world to this day. In fact, Bush's book of paintings even includes a portrait of Iraqi linguist Tony George Bush, no relation, just in case you were wondering. And along with the portrait, the book includes a loving email sent from Tony to the president, praising him and the military for the invasion of Iraq. The message here isn't just a simple reminder that, hey, deep down, we're all Americans and we should, we should come together on the really important stuff. Instead, it's partisan, self-serving, taking the half-assed justification for the invasion of Iraq, a lie once told by Bush, and reformatting it into conventional wisdom. It's just PR after the fact, and boy, does the news love to help with that. And I don't know, maybe we, we shouldn't do that? Like, you could argue that treating Bush as some sort of pariah doesn't change the past, I guess. It does make the present feel better, though. Also, that's not how accountability works, or should. It's not how memory works. Traditionally speaking, we don't give people passes for crimes and atrocities, not just because we're seeking out justice, but also to make sure future bastards feel like there are consequences for their actions and perhaps don't also do bad things. Of course, traditionally speaking, we also hired a bunch of Nazis after World War II, so maybe this is just always how it is and will always be. So I guess what I mean is, 
let's actively try to avoid what, traditionally speaking, we do with monsters. It's kind of like how we want to recognize the wrongdoings of idolized historical figures and maybe, ah, oh, geez, not have statues of them just lying around. You know, perhaps we should teach the good and the bad of history in our schools and junk like that. But what do I know? The point is, Donald Rumsfeld died the day we filmed this. A beautiful coincidence. And we, you know, can't wait for the gushing profiles about the guy who totally didn't know he was lying us into a war. Gonna be a real Baja blast when a bunch of weird dupes start scolding the world for celebrating the peaceful old age death of a wealthy war criminal surrounded by his loving family. You know, cause that family will definitely pull up Twitter and read all the mean things people said. How dare us? And so, even though it's less polite, as in Rumsfeld is dead, huzzah, huzzu, huzzé, praise be, let's maintain our perspective on these past leaders. Be them a Bush, or that rapist one, or that guy who really loved to kill people with flying robots. And let's not forget history's greatest monster. You know the one. Just because they're getting old and more folksy and reminding us of our grandparents doesn't absolve them. Ah, look! That war criminal gave the nice lady candy at the funeral for the guy whose supporters called her husband a terrorist. How sweet. And if you really don't see the big deal here, allow me to give you an added emphasis. Well, first of all, I never hated Donald Trump. You know, I felt sorry for him as a person. I also felt sorry for the people who believed in his lies, you know? Ah, there it is. That thing we've been circling this whole time, which is that all this bullshit we're seeing with people like George Bush, it's already starting with Donald Trump. Now, Noah here isn't saying that he loves Donald Trump and wants to kiss his boo-boos, but it is foreshadowing of people wanting to kiss his boo-boos because whatever current president is also bad. It's inevitable that when he gets really old and sick and starts to fade and eventually dies in like six months, there will be this weird expectation from people in the center and liberal circles to like, be nice about it. Or maybe he'll write a book or f***ing paint, go bowling with Jimmy Kimmel or whatever, go on The Late Show where Stephen Colbert says f***ing this. So there is analysis of intelligence that you believe that there are weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, and I believe that sincerely. I don't think anybody made up the belief no, no. that there were weapons of mass destruction. I don't, that is, that is cynicism beyond I would ever want to think of my government. Mm -hmm. Stephen, you sweet, sweet summer Child, what did they do to you? Did they kidnap your sweet summer children? Do you need help? Do you need help? Knowing about the Project for the New American Century, whose members included Rumsfeld and Dick Cheney, a group that urged Bill Clinton to pursue the removal of Saddam Hussein's regime from power, a group whose pre-2000 report posited that in order to do so, they would need, quote, some catastrophic and catalyzing event like a new Pearl Harbor, a group whose members became the vice president and the secretary of Defense, a Secretary of Defense who, according to a book by Bob Woodward, the day after 9-11, said that Iraq should be a principal target of the first round of terrorism. Do you need any more help, Stephen Colbert? The point is, there will be people talking about how sweet and old he got, or how in Trump's mind, he was doing the right thing all along. But, you know, maybe f that. Maybe I don't give a sweltering sh** that Donald Trump can't flush for some reason, whether or not Donald Trump or Bush or all these other honkies thought they were doing the right thing, but rather what they actually did. Like, here's the f***ing Associated Press after Rumsfeld's death. Donald Rumsfeld, a cunning leader undermined by Iraq war, undermined by the thing he did, the thing he lied about so he could do it. War criminal undermined by war crimes, unfucking real. The point is, to get back to pop culture if I fucking have to, less Zemo dancing, more Zemo getting put in the raft. But also, Tony Stark built a robot that blew up a city, so maybe also let's not honor him either. Seems less important since he's fictional, but like, I don't know. A lot of blood on that guy's hands. I definitely lost the thread here. Much like Rumsfeld lost his life. Huzzah! Bye, Donald! This is the part where I say thanks for watching. It's the part where I say like and subscribe. It's the part where I say leave a comment, nice or mean. It's your big day.
And we've got a patreon.com slash some more news and a podcast called Even More News and Warmbo merch. We all love Warmbo. Oh, I bet Warmbo is really sad about Rumsfeld. Warmbo, you okay, buddy?